Let me shift the question a little bit. Not so much what Europe can learn from the rest of the world, or even what Europeans can learn, but what researchers in Europe can learn. I say this because I work in science, especially health and environment, and also in interpreting science in its social context. Well, obviously, one of the things that the world outside Europe um, knows is that there are structural constraints. The global south knows well about uh, underdevelopment and about structural adjustment. And at a, a smaller scale, they know about uh, the effects of neoliberalism as, for example, HIV antiretrovirals uh, are not given by funding agencies to Haitian women because the cost benefit is not uh, enough under the schemes of neoliberalism. Everything has to be in an economic metric. But an example from my own experience is in plant breeding in the 19 in the 1970s and into the early 1980s, there was a lot of attention in breeding plants uh, across the world so that you could get different varieties that would work well in different locations. But with the advent of molecular biology, the tinkering that was done of genomes to try to change some aspect of their physiology led to uh, a much smaller set of cultivars, a much smaller set of um, varieties, and the pressure was to change the uh, locations, change the environments, to make them uniform, to make them suitable for these uh, genetically modified plants. And even if uh, those programs weren't necessarily successful or haven't necessarily been successful in all places, the kinds of research stations that worked on the much more um, locally modulated breeding have given way to being the high-tech molecular biology work. But I also, when we talk about structural constraints, I think we need to think about the structuring uh, and that that's more complex. In any aspect of research, there are conditions and there are consequences. Uh, a good example of consequences is the most successful genetic diagnosis is for phenylketonuria, PKU, in the United States, uh, growing since the early 1960s. Newborns have been tested for PKU, and then if they've got it, they get put on a special diet, and that diet can prevent the severe re retardation um, that used to lead to early death for people with PKU. Well, that's the story that, that likes to be told. Genetic can lead to change. But um, two things. One is there are very few other examples. And the second one is to make that change, you have to have enormous other changes in the infrastructure that aren't always there. You have to supply a diet, and it's not necessarily covered by, uh, it's expensive and it's not necessarily covered by insurance or the government. You have cultural habits. You have peers' uh, pressure, particularly in teenage years, to go along with um, what everyone else is eating. And there is still some slight uh, reduction in uh, ability to calculate, to do the, to put together the diet, and it can lead to effects if you're a woman with PKU on the on any um, baby any fetus you have, so this genetics leads to medical amelioration is actually uh, much too simple a story. It, the consequences depend on a lot of infrastructure that may or may not be put in place. So it assumes that infrastructure, and the conditions for any bit of research, uh, we might ask, why have there been has there been so much investment in biotechnology when uh, there are so few genetic conditions that have led to uh, treatment that have come out of it? Well, that was the promise of it. Well, there's many promises out of genomics. Uh, it's a field that makes promises. And it, um, we have to think about the conditions where promises, uh, the neoliberal financialization of everything, where promises count as much as the actual substance. 
And of course, biotech and big pharma have benefited from the promises, the idea that uh, invest in us, give us the uh, patents. Though in the United States, the patent protection has partly been taken away this year. Um, and so that's the structuring that happens. And some of that structuring makes it very difficult for anyone who wants to do countervailing research to believe that it's actually, or to make it actually happen, even when they can see the flaws, as I've um, suggested. So something the researchers in Europe can learn from the rest of the world is that sometimes the structures are very dominant. They'll shift plant breeding from um, serving the public service to serving the market. They'll perpetuate uh, promising uh, programs, where promising in this sense means programs that make promises and live on make promises and so on. But the paradox here is that the center, which is in Europe and say the United States, often is a place where a diversity of initiatives come up that begin to do that work of subverting the structure, of changing some of those complicated conditions and paying attention to the consequences. And here I think, for example, of the change in, in Down syndrome, uh, the treatment of people with Down syndrome uh, in society over the last 20 years, it's been enormous in the United States. They've gone from people who are isolated, people who are seen as a huge problem, to people who are different and have definitely have uh, challenging health conditions, but are, are very much more integrated uh, into education and into society. Um, and at the same time, paradoxically, as uh, prenatal diagnosis leads to various couples uh, aborting before the, the child's been born. Um, but anyway, the, the um, Down syndrome is kind of a leader in the kind of solidarities that, that parents build up, that so, it's a social movements to make something that had been very difficult and isolating for families even just 20 years ago. Um, something which is part of the um, diverse complexity of societies. So that's some of the things I think that uh, researchers in Europe can learn by thinking about themselves as part of a world that knows about structural constraints and the complexity of the structuring of those constraints.